Hi everyone, once again I'm Sarah Mraes of Vertical Measures, here today with Tim Ash, author of the best-selling book Landing Page Optimization and CEO of SiteTuners. Today's webinar is titled Turbocharging Your SEM Landing Pages. It will be available uh, for replay to all uh, those who've registered. We'll be sending out a private link, uh, given no technical difficulties of course. Uh, Tim will be happy to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, so please make sure to ask them in the chat applet located on your screen. And if you are having any technical difficulties, please attempt to reconnect. If you would like to discuss the webinar on Twitter, today's hashtag is PPCWebinar. Um, and I'm sure Tim would love to tweet with you. Um, as you can see, his Twitter handle is on the screen. So uh, without further delay, let's go ahead and get started. Tim, please take it away. Well, uh, thanks so much, Sarah. I appreciate you hosting this webinar. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, my name is Tim Ash, and I'm the CEO of SiteTuners. Just by way of quick background and where I'm going to be coming from, uh, we work with clients of all sizes, and we improve their conversion rates of their individual landing pages of their, or their websites. We do uh, web-based landing page reviews and best practices redesigns of websites to, uh, for conversion. We also have landing page test plans uh, and we guarantee the performance of those. Uh, anyway, big clients, small clients, but that's not really what you're here to talk about or listen in on. I'm going to talk today about ignoring your landing pages. And some of you may have heard some of this content before or maybe even all of it, but I just want to sound this call to action, which is uh, if you're not doing anything about it, if you don't take it, actionable concrete steps after this webinar, you're costing your company money. And that's the bottom line. Um, there was a survey that said that for every dollar spent on landing page optimization, $83 is spent driving traffic to landing pages. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that seems a little bit out of whack. So we we kind of tend to focus where the money is, and the money seems to be in your pay-per-click marketing budget, but it's really not where your profits are. Uh, you can do your long tail keyword research, you can do your bid management, you can tweak your ad groups and try to raise your quality score, but at the end of the day, if those people are not having their expectations met on your landing page, it's costing you a lot of money. And it's driving up your CPAs, it's also constraining the scale of your campaign. So I'm going to start with a couple of insults here today and close with a couple of commitments and hopefully what you'll find in between will tie those two together. But I want to just start by saying that you're all ignorant and blind. Now obviously I don't know most of you on this webinar personally, but I say that because I'm in that category too. I sit in an office. You may sit in an office or a cubicle or if you're lucky in your home office, but you're not really talking to the end users of your website, to your clients as it were. And that's definitely an issue. Most of us don't have a direct experience very often with the end user. Hello? Um, the other thing that I would say is that we have uh, another tendency which is not to see are ugly babies. And what do I mean by that? Well, most of us are in love with our websites. And those websites are suboptimal, to put it mildly. I don't know how to put it another way, but basically your baby is ugly. And so that's how I'm going to say it. Um, unfortunately, as parents of our own children, we're in love with them. We think they're beautiful. In fact, I would say that the, the real danger lies in having a warped perspective of your landing page. Most of us see our web marketing as something like uh, rolling out the red carpet. Uh, hey, you know, people just waltz on into our website and they hit our landing page and they just naturally want to fill out our forms and give us their money, and that's just not the case. The reality of the situation, the very hard truth, is that it's just the opposite. It's a little bit more like scaling the castle walls in the middle of a siege. This is really what our landing pages look like from our visitor's perspective. And the problem is we built these walls brick by brick by brick deliberately, uh, maybe not intentionally, but we did it nevertheless. The, these, these walls are built out of compromise, out of group thinking, out of copying 
a little feature of a landing page that you saw on somebody else's website. Uh, it's, it's built out of the opinions of the CEO of your company and whoever else gets to chime in, perhaps your creative director or your, your brand VP. And nevertheless, maybe they're built out of just misconceptions and ignorance, but these walls are very, very tall and people have to scale them. So I'm going to talk today about tearing down those walls, and I'm going to use a framework that some of you may be familiar with, which are the seven deadly sins of landing page design. Now, this is something that we found useful, and again, even if, if you've heard some of this content, I would challenge you, have you done anything about it? So as you go through this, we're, we're going to go through the seven deadly sins, I want you to ask, what can I do with this information? How did this apply to me? Do the translation right now in your heads and be very, very honest. This is an inventory, folks, an inventory of very common problems, most of which I bet you are on your landing pages today. So I'm going to start with the first deadly sin, and that is an unclear call to action. And the vast majority of the examples I'm using today were actually pulled from Google AdWords. I clicked on pay-per-click ads and was taken to these pages. And shockingly enough, uh, people are paying money to drive a lot of traffic to pages like this. So let's think again from the perspective of our visitors because after all they're the only ones that matter exactly what's going on and what questions are they asking. So one possible question that somebody might want to ask is a perfectly reasonable one is what am I supposed to do on this page? And that's usually a fair question, right? What, well here's a perfect example. What are you supposed to do on this page? Well, I know sip a Corona, kick back in the sand. I'm taking the family on vacation down to Mexico, so this is going to be my view for the next 16 days, but I mean, that's not exactly something you want someone to think about on a website. Well, it turns out this is a catalog. Yeah, if you wait eight or nine seconds, this will refresh and take you to the home page of the catalog, but they're sending you to this page, and unless you think to click through, this is costing them business, this so-called splash page, pardon the pun, it really is a splash page, or gateway page is costing you, I'm guessing, 10 to 20 percent of your business from your pay-per-click campaign. It's just a horrible waste of resources and all because there's an unclear call to action. Now here's another example. This page I'm going to show you next is, uh, again, for some very specific purpose. Now think about it real quick. You're a smart marketer. You land on this page. What do they want you to do? Quick, look it over. I bet, you know, you're looking at at Vanna White, the lady pointing to the laptop. I bet you're looking at the screenshots of the reports. You're reading that red text that says call before December 30th. And the fact is, they don't want you to do any of those things. Bizarrely enough, some of the folks that, that get this, um, well, not surprisingly, are, are iPhone users. They actually want you to click on that little black iPhone that says 30 day free trial. Now, even if you are an Apple loyalist, you probably have to agree you paid attention to it, but there's no way you would say, hey, that's the main focus of the page. That's really what they want me to do is click on the iPhone. I mean, how bizarre is that? This is a pay-per-click landing page on AdWords. And by the way, big companies who screw this kind of stuff up royally all the time as well. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with 1-800-Flowers. They're a huge company. They do at least a billion dollars a year, I think, and several hundred million that's online. Now, this is their product detail page. A lot of you, if you have product catalogs, are shooting traffic to specific product detail pages. You've been told, hey, this is a best practice, right? You want to get as specific as you can and send them to the most relevant part of the site. If you're looking for, you know, red uh, Nike Air Sports or whatever, you want to take them to the product detail page for that. Or if they're looking for roses, you want to take them to this page. That's great, except What's the desired call to action here? What do they actually want you to do in terms of interacting with the page? Well, maybe it's something like uh, looking at that big giant rose. That's Well, no, that's just there to tell you you're in the roses category. Maybe they want you to sign in because that's emphasized. Well, wait a second. You don't have anything in your shopping cart yet. Uh, maybe they want you to celebrate mom for who she is and click on that banner ad up top, which is going to take you to guess where? yet another landing page somewhere on the site. In other words, another product detail page, not this one. So if you think about all these calls to action, it's very, very unclear. What they actually want you to do is interact with this form in the middle and then to click that select delivery date button. 
Yes, the least interesting visually thing on the page is the desired call to action. So they, um, 1-800-Flowers asked us to kind of, as a mock-up or concept, redesign this page, leaving all of, of course, the actionable information on the page and making the call to action clear. And this is the page that we came up with. So when you see this, I want you to think to yourself, what is the desired call to action? Boom. I bet as soon as you see this page, you'll say, push the green button that says view delivery dates. Now, why was that? You know, you say, well, yeah, that's obvious. And uh, but what's the big innovation here? Well, the big innovation is we decluttered the page. We got rid of attention that was going to other things. All of those other things that we considered on the original page are now gone. There's a giant picture of the flowers, which is what you want because that's the hero shot or your product. It's very visible. It's very attractive. It's what you want people to focus on. And then there's an action block against the light blue color with the clear button. And so another way to kind of think about visual attention on the page is to use some kind of attention tracking, which can be done in the form of eye tracking or mouse tracking, or as the case may be here with our attention wizard software. This just predicts where someone's attention is going to go on during the first few seconds on a landing page. It doesn't even have to be a live page. It can be a mock-up. You just upload a screenshot or, or a file and, and you get this. So the attention heat map here tells us what the focus of the page can be, is going to be. And there are two types of attention, I guess kind of like cholesterol in that way. Good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Well, there's good attention and bad attention. As you can see here, the biggest attention hotspot is actually on the flowers, which is great. That's where we want it to be. Now, if you think about it, there's very little attention uh, uh, there's also lots of attention on various graphically interesting photographic images on the page. And again, that's something probably not a good idea because those are not good uses of my initial attention. And there's very little predicted attention on the actual desired call to action. There's no hot spot over that button. The eye just moves to visually interesting things in the scene. And uh, so to see if we can, we, when we designed our new page, we very carefully, you know, kind of iterated and came up with several heat maps of it on Attention Wizard. And as you can see on the mock-up, we were able to get attention exactly where we wanted it. The giant cluster of attention on the hero image. And of course, you're not going to miss that button, folks. Should be pretty obvious. And do you see how even the yellow lines in between, which kind of show your involuntary eye movements or saccades, that's it. You know, how your brain makes sense of the world is by taking your field of high focus, which is very narrow, and moving it to interesting places in the scene. Well, you know, there's even the eye movement just ping-pongs back and forth between the hero shot and the call to action. Hero shot, call to action. So there's no wasted attention. So one thing I want to leave you with on this deadly sin is the obvious standard. If your call to action is not obvious, then you're losing money. And the way to make it obvious is to get rid of all the distractions, not to make it more prominent. Although the, that is a pretty big fat button. But the point is it's operating on a very clean page without a lot of other distractions. Which uh, leads me to deadly sin number two, too many choices. Now one thing that we tend to do as marketers is pile on everything, including the kitchen sink, onto our landing pages. And often our landing pages, in the case of a website or, or especially a large catalog, are our home pages. And those really suffer under the weight of this. Now I'm, I'm going to save you the trouble. This is the home page of Adorama, a big photography supply catalog. They have 146 clickable links on this page. What do you want me to do? Click on one of the ads on the right hand side, perhaps? or one of these 12 featured items, perhaps I need a walk stool out of the 50,000 items you carry, or click on item number 16 in your left-hand menu because that says tripods. I, I don't know, it's, it's all very bewildering. Oh, this is my favorite actually. How to master dog photography by Bowser. Yes, I came there to read that exact article. Eh, probably not. So when you think about this craziness of having 146 choices for me on this page, uh, how can you deal with that complexity? How do you narrow down the number of choices? Well, actually, uh, Adorama's competitor, B&H Photo, does a great job with this. They're actually more high-end pro gear, but and their landing page, this is an old shot that are actually doing even better on their new page if you go visit it, is not some paragon of good usability. But in the middle of the page, they have visual 
uh, pictures to describe their high-level categories. So, what, you know, do they sell plasma TVs? Well, yeah, it's obvious. How about laptops? Well, yeah, there's a picture one. How about uh, cameras? Yeah, there's those as well. So, plasmas, laptops, cameras, bingo. Okay, I have an information set to follow. I can get off of the home page, and then um, you, you, I can follow it deeper into the site where I'm having a more relevant conversation. Um, we had a question about Attention Wizard uh, from Patrick, uh, where, where is this tracking done? Uh, this is a, a software algorithm, just to be clear. Attention Wizard is a prediction based on what we know about visual processing in the brain of where people will look. So you, just, you can just go to Attention Wizard, there's a one cent trial and uh, try it out. Just upload a, a screenshot or a mockup and you get your heat map back instantly. Uh, but the, the main point of this is that we, we're taking the too many choices, not 146, and even though there are a lot of links on this page and the navigation as well, we effectively have reduced it down to the what category do you want to go down, and you can get closer to your goal. And that's very, very important, not taking apparent complexity and hiding it. It's your job to create a good information architecture, or hierarchy of categories on your page or in your catalog, and, and so spend a lot of time doing that and supporting them with graphics if, uh, so people can instantly recognize them because people will process pictures four to five hundred times faster than letters. So a picture isn't worth a thousand words, but it's worth four to five hundred characters, which is still a lot, and it's, it's how we naturally operate. Uh, let's talk about another deadly sin uh, of pay-per-click landing pages, and that is asking for too much information. Now, this is very common, and it's due to what I, uh, this in marketers, and that's called greedy marketer syndrome. Yes, I unfortunately am infected with this disease myself. I tend to ask for too much information and not give as much in return, and we're all guilty of that. And we wouldn't think of doing that in the normal world if somebody, if you walked into a store and there somebody greeted you by the entrance and said, hi, welcome to our shop. Do you mind if I hold your credit card while you shop? You'd probably say, you know, what are you, a Looney Tune? But online, we do this kind of stuff all the time. We ask for very forward information. Here's an example of another pay-per-click landing page. Now, this company does debt negotiation leads. They, they want people to, you know, that have credit card debts to uh, fill out the form, and then they sell that lead to a debt negotiation company. Now look at this form. I know it may be a little hard to see, so I'm going to read it off for you. Look at the information they're asking for. First name, spouse, last name, email, home phone, work phone, cell phone, best time to call, state, and so on and so on. Are you kidding me? Think about this. This is so invasive, and they're asking for so much information. And so we do, we're doing a landing page test for this company, and we asked them, well, um, how exactly, what exactly do you do with this information? And the answer they had was very telling. And the answer was, we call them. We sell these leads, so we can't have junk leads. So we qualify every one of these people to make sure they're a legitimate prospect. Otherwise, people will start buying leads from us. And so, so well, what's the minimum of information you need in order to know whether to give them a call back? And that's what ended up actually being on the winning page in our uh, multivariate test. Now here it is. A lot of things have changed on the page. We have a different, you know, cute couple picture. We have uh, trust symbols in the form of various seals on the right. We've reduced the text a lot. But I bet you dollars to donuts that the most important change here was making this form shorter and less imposing. Because this is the only information they need to qualify a lead. First, last, email, phone, state because they have different laws, and debt amount they know whether it's worth calling me back based on that. And 51% increase, this was across the board. It was not just for the form fills, but also for calls to their toll-free number, which is a much higher close rate and much higher value form. Let me show you another example. One of our clients, Hearing Planet, uh, sells hearing aids uh, from a variety of manufacturers. And of course, you need to get a hearing aid test first, but before you even do that, they have this great landing page. They say, they say we're going to give you something of value first. By the way, this is great, uh, uh, how would you say, a bribe or link bait or whatever you want to call this, but they're basically saying, let us be the thought leader. Let us inform you about this topic. And if you guys haven't read Seth Godin's 
permission marketing. You should go out and get a copy. And uh, Seth talks about this all the time. You have to give more than you get. The reciprocity principle gets kicked in. So here they have this great buyer's guide to hearing aids. And what are they asking for on this form? Now, this is a downloadable ebook, mind you. So how would you say, you know, what are they asking for? First name, last name, okay, street, city, state, zip, country, and then email, daytime phone, alternative phone, and how can we help? Does anybody see a problem with this? Folks, it's an ebook. It's a downloadable ebook, and they're asking for my street mailing address. I'm not going to give them that. Why would they possibly need that? Are they going to uh, send me junk mail? Are they going to stock my house? Do they want to know where I live? And this is really just a, you know, a, a, a front for a, a robbery ring. I have no idea, but it's certainly not appropriate for them to ask for that information. So what is it appropriate to ask? What is it appropriate to ask? What's the minimum information you need to get a downloadable ebook? Think about that for a second. Now, I bet you that many of you are saying just the email address, right? No problem. Well, you know what I'd say? I'd say you're infected with greedy marketer syndrome. Yes, you don't even need their email address. When you think about it, what do you need for me to download an ebook? Nothing. You need exactly nothing. Let me download the ebook. And in this case, with a high ticket item worth thousands of dollars, if it gets in the hands of my insurance company and my healthcare provider and and the caretakers of my aging parents, it probably has a lot of value. But it can't do that unless somebody downloads it. So get out of their way. The only thing you lose is a sense of control. In your ebook, you can still have a link that says, go schedule your nearby hearing test and take them back to an actionable page. So now they weren't willing to go that far. So we asked them, what, you know, what can you live with? Um, and they said, well, just basically take off the street address, which we did, and got them an immediate 17% bump in conversion. Very easy stuff to do, folks. So don't be a greedy marketer. Don't ask for too much information too early in the process. Now, you may say, well, I ultimately need all of that information, and that's great, but you should use progressive disclosure. You should collect it in several steps. When you have a reason to, when you've established a stronger relationship with me, then you can ask me for more. Give first, ask for more later. All right, another very, very common problem on pay-per-click landing pages is too much text. Yes, nobody likes to read in front of computer monitors. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jacob Nielsen, who's keynoted our conversion conference uh, in the past, has done study after study on this and basically has shown that if you want retention of information to increase, if you want conversion to increase, cut down the text. Can you believe that this page that I'm about to show you is actually a pay-per-click landing page on Google AdWords? I was just in Vegas recently. This is Canyon Tours, and they're sending traffic to this page. Grand Canyon Tours offers 180 tours and activities at the Grand Canyon. Tours by bus, uh, airplane, helicopter, train, rap, jeep. I'm sure they do it by donkey as well, but that's not the point. No one's reading that tiny little text in the middle of the page. So when you approach your landing pages, you have to look at this. This is a wall. Remember that wall I showed you on the, uh, the castle wall? This is a castle wall. That's how much effort it would take for me to actually read this page. And the likelihood of it being read is very, very close to zero. Uh, and I'm sure your seventh grade grammar teacher would be proud of the fact that you're finally writing in paragraphs and complete sentences. But don't do it. Unlearn that mistake. For the, for the prospect on your landing page, they want instant access to information. So organize it quickly. Have a um, bullet lists, short bullet points, cut out all of the adjectives, don't make any claims you can substantiate. Here's another example of a landing page, believe it or not, on Google AdWords. Yes, I know it's for rack-mounted servers and it's pretty geeky stuff, but even geeks don't like to have their time wasted. No one is reading this stuff at all. This is just a criminal use of, of a landing page to expect me to read. You should say, okay, uh, skinny rack mounted servers, fat rack mounted servers. Get me off that page, get me closer to where, where I need to go. Uh, but you don't need me to have all the technical specs right on this page. It's just insanity. All right. Um, now, one of the things that, um, you know, one of the questions we have from Curtis is, so you're providing a quality product in the hopes that they'll, you'll bring them back to the site and they become a lead? Absolutely. You have to focus on uh, kind of getting the word across about your product 
And uh, remember that they're not necessarily going to take the standing broad jump, especially if it's expensive of buying from you immediately. You may need to nurture them. You may need to have a series of actions on your page, micro conversions. Uh, give us your email. Download the ebook. Okay, then uh, schedule a consultation. Then get a tour or demo. Then buy from us, or, or whatever the sequence may be for your business. Uh, but you can't uh, just you know, squeeze the bottom of the funnel and hope that they're going to take the standing broad jump. All right. Now, one of the biggest failings of pay-per-click landing pages, and this is very, very common is not keeping your promises. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, a lot of times, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're spending a lot of money, how would you say, driving traffic to your page. So you have the pay-per-click team you, or person. You have the landing page person or webmaster, and they generally don't talk to each other. They work in isolation. And that's a huge missed opportunity. Because you know what? People don't just arrive on your landing page. You know, let's not like, transporting themselves onto the hollow deck of the Starship Enterprise on Star Trek. It's not like that. You have to actually, they came from somewhere, was it, whether it was a comparison shopping engine, uh, a link that their friend posted on their Facebook page, a search result on Google. All of these things are le uh, legitimate kind of uh, setups or upstream experiences, but the point is all, what all of them share in common is an intention was set, an expectation was set upstream. And you better deliver on that promise when they get to your landing page. So let me show you an example. Let's say I Google best digital camera. And um, I, you know, I get this pay-per-click ad. Now the ad says, let's deconstruct it here and it shows up. Okay, best digital camera. Huh, hey, that's what I typed in. Yeah, I'm definitely interested. Let's see. Get expert reviews of top digital cameras from Consumer Reports. Well, that's good. I think I'm sure if I read expert reviews of the top cameras, I'm sure I could find the best one. And look, it's from Consumer Reports, a very trusted, uh, neutral consumer education company. You know, they don't have a vested interest in any of these products. They don't take advertising in their magazine or on their website. It's all subscription-based. Good stuff. So think about my intention. What am I going to get on the next page? Well, I'm going to get access to expert reviews from a trusted source. I have a very high expectation. Except I get to the landing page, folks, and Houston, we have a problem. The page starts off well enough, top-rated digital cameras, over 56 models tested. Here are some great brand names on the upper right that, that uh, I'm you know, responding to. Those are all good. And then in the middle of the page, they have this red button. Actually, there are two of them on the page. Join today. Join today. Wow. Well, think about this. Is this something that, um, what's my expectation? Remember, what's my intent? What happened in that upstream ad that I just saw? It said, get expert reviews of top digital cameras from Consumer Reports. Hey, where are the expert reviews? You're lying to me. This is like putting a brick wall in front of somebody who's running at 60 miles an hour. I'm excited. I have my expectations up. This is good stuff. I'm going to get reviews. Uh, sorry. Crack open your wallet. Give us your money. And then you can have the reviews. Do you see? This is a huge disconnect, and this happens all the time. You you craft your pay-per-click copy. You get your you know you got your headline. You got your 25 character headline. You have your two lines of 40 characters each, or whatever it is currently. Then you you just got all that perfect information in there. Phew! Are you a genius? And by the way, it stands out from all the other ads on the page. Double goodie. Okay. Except, what's in the ad isn't on the landing page. So keep your promises. Otherwise, you're going to have really really bad experiences. All right, by the way, before we move on, there are some questions about um, you know, landing pages and the, how much content is acceptable on a landing page. And a lot of times, pay-per-click landing pages do double duty also as SEO landing pages, which we don't think is a best practice. You should really pull those apart and, and customize them. But regardless, uh, you need content on landing pages. If it's just a pass-through page, Google will ding you in quality score. Um, they want a good user experience, but the point is that content doesn't have to dominate the page. The calls to action should be clear at the top of the page, and then if you need some explanatory content to lay out your value proposition or the details of your product, you can put that on the page further down or in a light box popover under a see details link. That's all perfectly acceptable. For the deliberate people, uh, definitely have that deep content. It doesn't cost you anything to publish it. But my main point was don't make everybody slog through a swamp full of, of paragraph text. 
that that's the bad news. And uh, you know, likewise uh, on this page, you know, there's a lot of text, but the call to action is pretty clear. So I don't think the the text really interferes with it. The problem is the call to action is wrong and it's deceptive. Uh, but you can have landing pages with with plenty of text. All right, let's talk next about uh, one of my favorites, and um, I'm kind of a recovering, uh, I guess, wannabe artist. I studied visual uh, you know, uh, art in at University of California as one of my minors, and I do photography and painting and drawing as well. But I have to say, some of the worst damage on landing pages is inflicted by visual designers in the form of visual distractions. And sorry, folks, if I'm talking to any designers out there, but it's true. So uh, let me show you a landing page to show you what I mean. Again, pay-per-click landing page on Google AdWords. Now, think about this. You get on this page. What's the first thing you want to do? And I bet you a lot of you are saying, hit the back button. Yeah, because this page is a visual assault. Now, again, actually, I can't put this at the feet of bad visual design because obviously no designers were used in the creation of this page. But nevertheless, it's, you can just see it's just crazy reds and greens. By the way, you're not getting the full glory of it because the uh, reverse yellow driving directions link near the middle of the page is actually flashing uh, on and off, blinking. So good stuff, Maynard, but no one's buying barbells here. They're just hitting the back button. And, you know, the visual distractions come in a variety of forms. How many of you have rotating banner ads or scrolling little tickers that show the latest tweets coming out of your company? Uh, those are all visual distractions because motion will reset the eye. Our little reptilian brain kicks in and says, hey, something just changed in the environment. I've got to make sure that I'm safe. Should I run from it? Should I fight with it? Should I eat it? Should I screw it? Those are the kind of instantaneous decisions we're making whenever there's a change in our environment. So be very, very careful with motion and, and um, video. Now, it could be good for conversion, could be get bad for conversion, but it's guaranteed to grab my attention. So you have to be very conscious of how it impacts the visual hierarchy on your page and how attention is going to get moved around. So here's another example of motion. Actually, I landed on this, another pay-per-click landing page for on Google AdWords. Oh, by the way, before I could get to see the page, this little pop-up box showed up. Now I'm talking about instantly, before I could see the rest of the page, that pop-up box showed up. And in it, it had it said questions, chat live with an online representative. And Jane says, hello, how may I help you? And of course, by now, you're probably guessing what my answer is, which is, go away, Jane. And unfortunately, I tried to click on the little X in the lower right border of that. But here's the thing, folks. It started on the left side of the page. And then it moved very quickly to the right. Yes, indeed. I, had to, I tried to follow it along. I couldn't click on it. And then it bounced off the right-hand side, and it went back in the other direction. And it was really annoying. It actually took me several seconds and several tries to hit that tiny little X, and eventually I was able to make it go away. Now, who thinks this visual distraction was a good idea? You know, some genius probably said, well, we need them to be aware of the fact that we have chat. Well, hello, that's fine. I'm not arguing against multiple goals on the page. Guess what? They already had that picture of the, the generic stock photo of the model with their hair pulled back in a bun with the smile and the boom mic. I mean, we've all seen that. If I had a nickel for every time I saw that, I probably wouldn't be doing this webinar because I'd be retired on my Caribbean island by now. But you know, So it's OK to have multiple goals on your page. It's OK to say, hey, primary goal is to look at the page. Secondary goal is to make them aware that we have chat help. Fine. But that's not the same as a visual distraction on the way in. How do I know if I need chat help when I haven't even looked at your page yet? It just makes absolutely no sense. So be really careful with this kind of stuff. By the way, exit pop-ups, completely different story. Completely different story. You know, they're leaving already. If you paid to get them there, you might as well try to extract some value. So, so pop an offer, ask a survey question, give them a 10% discount, um, yeah, I, whatever. That's fine because you're probably never going to see them again. If they found you through a pay-per-click, add, they're probably not going to try to memorize your website or the URL of that landing page. All right, um, let's talk about a very important topic. I know this is something that Ren was very interested in finding out, and that is how important are trust icons above the fold? Well, we're going to talk about that next, so perfect timing. You're reading my mind. 
I want to talk about trust in general, though. Trust is really, really important. Uh, we don't do business with people and websites we don't trust. Uh, I mean, think about what we value in our relationships. Uh, if I said someone is two-faced or mentally ill or inconsistent or totally random and unpredictable, would you trust them? No, we value consistency and logic and rationality and, and you know, a, a solid appearance and basically, you know, be, the most important thing you have in life, some people would say, is your word. My word is my bond. My integrity depends on me carrying out everything I commit to every time, religiously, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. You know when I say something, I'm going to do it. Wow, okay, that gives you a lot of trust. But it's really hard to do online because you have to do it anonymously. We don't have a face-to-face -face relationship. You don't know who I am as a website visitor. And you have to do it instantly. A study from a Canadian university a few years ago said people will form a first impression by, of appearance of your landing page in 1 20th of a second. That's fast, folks. That's subliminal. That's automatic. You can't fool it. In other words, we know a cheesy site when we see it. Now, one way we can overcome that appearance, well, first of all, you should have a, a good-looking website and the production quality should be high, but one other way you can, can build up some trust is by using trust symbols. Now, here's an example. Here's a tall scrolling page of Smart Bargains, and I've kind of highlighted the bottom of it. There's a row of great trust symbols down there. VeriSign, shipped by UPS, uh, shopping.com, four-star rating, Visa, MasterCard, Better Business Online, Bill Me Later. All of these are great trust symbols, transactional trust symbols. But they're below the fold. Now, it used to be really bad. It used to be only 5% of people would scroll down to the bottom of a page like this. And we're seeing more adoption. You know, now we all have those little scrolly wheels on our mice. But still, only 15% of people, based on the latest stats, will see the bottom of that page. In other words, I put it another way, 85% of people will not see those very important trust symbols that you're paying for. Why are you hiding them down there? You can put your trust on a much better footing. Now, this is an extreme counterexample. PetSmart, uh, for a while, ran this as their homepage. And on the upper left of it, where you normally see the logo, they had the hacker safe symbol, which is now called McAfee Secure. And they're so proud of their transactional trust, they put that where the brand goes against a very strong kind of usability convention. And of course, to compensate for that, there's no doubt what the website is. They jumbo size their logo and put in the middle of the header. But you instantly get this two-part message, which is, we're safe to shop with, we're pet smart. And you see how that works? They put their transactional trust out front, on top, above the fold, definitely. And, and then, so transactional trust and putting those symbols above the fold is critical. If you're not sure about it, test it. I mean, all these the trust seal folks have. We we work with trustee and buy safe and McAfee, and you know, basically it's usually a five to fifteen percent lift if those things are up uh, higher on the page and they're visible. So very powerful. Now another form of trust though is visual appearance. So you know we talked about first impressions. And the question is, here's another pay-per-click landing page on Google AdWords. If you go up there right now and you type in Grand Pianos on Google, you're going to get a pay-per-click ad from Rick Jones Pianos. And they take you to this butt-ugly homepage. Grand Piano, anyone? Now, I'm sorry, I pick on them all the time, but they haven't changed their site in years, so I can still use the same screenshot. They are the biggest spender on the word Grand Pianos on Google AdWords. I bet you they spend six figures a month driving traffic to this page, their home page. And it's not going to pass the smell test. It's not going to pass it at all. We know this is a cheesy site. This is like a throwback to 1995, you know, when links were cool. Hey, and you can embed a video. Now, my favorite feature of this, of course, is, are the two home page links. It's kind of like shift keys on a computer keyboard. You know, when one's just not enough, you need two home page links. Uh, hey, whatever. But I guess my point is, if you were thinking about buying a $25,000 grand piano, these people would not be considered credible. So they're really shooting themselves in the foot. And the irony is that they've been around for 25 years. They're the biggest seller of pianos in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. They uh, are authorized consult uh, sorry, repair and uh, sales for some of the biggest piano brands in the world, Steinway, Schimmel, and so on. And Think about it. You wouldn't know any of that from this page. So appearance matters. 
All right. Now, uh, if you are going to have trust symbols, Yale asked a question about whether you should uh, be linking to eBay feedback for trust. Absolutely. If you have trust in the form of uh, reviews or, you know, for example, uh, LinkedIn, if you can have you know, product reviews there or on consumer sites, yeah, link to the actual source of it or, or for trust seals, link to the actual verification that shows you the trust or the Better Business Online, A-plus rating. Yeah, you want the, those links. But for many trust symbols, you can just use them as badges. You don't have to link to them. I'll show you an example here on this next landing page. Now, uh, this is uh, one of our clients, SF Video, and this is a pay-per-click landing page that they had. It was just, a, they do large-scale DVD and Blu-ray duplication. And they have this instant quote form that we're running on Google AdWords. Now, look at the size of the instant quote form itself. It's only taking up maybe a quarter of the page. Now, why is that? Well, it's because they're, they're really lathering on the trust. They're lathering on the trust in the form of client logos. Most of the page is taken up by their, their clients. And I bet you, if you're thinking of getting some DVDs duplicated, you're thinking about, um, so your talk track, I bet, goes something like this. Wow, they work with Walmart and Nike and ABC and AT&T. I hope they take my little itty-bitty duplication job. I mean, maybe they're too high-priced, but, you know, but I hope they handle companies my size. I mean, does everybody get that? Think about it. Do you have any question that they could do the job, that they can deliver the goods? No, none. And by the way, some of you may be thinking, okay, you guys are a little logo wacko and you just put piled on too many onto that page. So we actually did this test, we back tested this and said what if we only had the top six logos and we arranged them in a, in a row uh, right next to the form and that should be enough. I mean, come on, isn't this overkill? And what we actually found was that the 58% advantage that we got with this page disappeared. That's right. It went, the 58% advantage of this page disappeared when we only went down to six logos. So sometimes too much is good in the form of trust symbols. Now it depends on where you're using them. On the home page of our own site, if you want to go check out sitetuners.com, you'll see we have some of our marquee client logos, but we do it in grayscale in a very, very subtle fashion. By the way, another question we had is, you know, should we, you know, should, well again, back to Yale's question, should we link uh, off, not necessarily if it's just client logos or something, don't link, uh, keep them on the page. Scott's also asking should we be still underlining links. I think if it's a text link, yes, that, that helps me understand that something is clickable. You shouldn't go against strong web conventions unless you have a real compelling reason to, to do it. Um, but you know, kind of back on this page, what we were saying is slather on the trust. Do it though in a way that's appropriate. If it's just supporting information, you want me to just glance at it, then do it a very subtly in grayscale, low contrast. But if, it's, uh, if you really want to shout about it, let me show you another example, then sometimes it's a good thing to put them in their full color glory. Oh, Real Age, I'm going to show you, is another one of our clients that has this online quiz. You take it, you tell them about your lifestyle, and they'll give you your quote unquote real age or how well you've maintained your body. In other words, you're not your chronological age, but your biological age, if you will. I happen to be seven years younger than I am, apparently, but I chalk that up to immaturity showing through. Oh, well, what can you do? But look at what they're doing. This, this was the, their real age quiz landing page, and they, put, they added, along with some other changes as a page during our test, a bunch of trust symbols in the form of media mentions. Think about that. Have you ever heard of Real Age? Probably not. Have you heard of the Today Show and CNN and New York Times? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you have, because those are media brands that have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars drumming their brands into our heads. And you get this umbrella effect. You get an umbrella effect that makes me trust the company they're associated with. So as seen on is a very, very powerful thing. And, and in this case, it increased conversion or people filling out this page by 40%, folks, same people. Same people coming through, 40% more filled out the form. Okay. So the, uh, Ralph is asking you know, when you should use colored logos versus grayscale. You know, one of the things you should do is you know, very carefully balance that. Uh, again, actually, I can see if I can pull up our home page here, and I will, I will show you what that looks like. 
go off script here for a second. And uh, again, just a, what we want is for somebody to come to our page and to instantly see what um, the, the, the client logo is in the middle of the page. Okay, there they are. But we want you to understand that we have two calls to action, well, actually three calls to action, one inside of our banner here, and then the, then the other two, small businesses and large businesses. Uh, so we don't want it to dominate the visual conversation. So this is an example of, of, of how to do it very low contrast. Uh, you can be in the, across the middle of the page or in a dedicated right trust column, but in any case, uh, you, we don't, on a very subtle page like that, we really don't want it to, Again, dominate the visual conversation. Okay, that's that's the main point. All right. Well, let's let's get back to our our regularly scheduled programming. I, I've talked about the seven deadly sins, I, but and I've talked about them in isolation. And um, the the question that you know, I probably could have used some of those examples for multiple sins because they illustrate multiple sins. Very few of us are without sin. Sorry, I keep pushing that sin analogy, but um, basically these things co-occur. Now I'm going to show you a real-life case study of the seven deadly sins, and there are four deadly sins in this on this page that I'm going to show you. Now I want you to see if you can pick them out. Just as a quick recap, in case you were sleeping or checking your email, these are the seven deadly sins: an unclear call to action, too many choices asking for too much information, too much text on the page, not keeping your promises, visual distractions, and lack of trust. And uh, I'm going to show you a page, and most of you are probably going to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with this page, and you'd be right. This is one of our clients. They're in the Bay Area, uh, progressive cell phone company called Credo Mobile. And they, they give money to a lot of progressive charities. And this is a well-designed landing page. It's on their brand colors, which are orange and the seafoam green and, and the, the grays. And here's an offer. This is for their in-house list. And uh, just get this phone, get this offer. But, but there are actually four deadly sins on this page. And I want to see if you can spot them. I'm going to give them to you real quick. Uh, the first is too much text. Have any of you read this yet? Well, guess what? You're unlikely to ever do it. How about this sentence over here under the main headline? You probably didn't read that either. There's just too much text. Even what seems like relatively little text is too much. Another thing we have are visual distractions. There are very bright colors on the page and dark, per, uh, dark gray borders. There's this giant O from Credo around the, the cell phone picture. Um, Another is unclear call to action. Now, some of you might argue with me, but I would say this get this offer button, even though it's the only green thing on the page, is actually not that clear in the presence of all of that other visual white noise, if you will. And another is lack of trust. Who are these people? Why would you um, just, why would you even think about interacting with them? Who are they? So what we did is we, we have this uh, service called an express review where we can critique a, a landing page in detail, and then we have a, a tactical service called Express Fix where we can redesign it. And so we came up with a mock-up of a redesigned page which they subsequently tested. And uh, here it is. Now we tried to address all of the deadly sins. Some of you may say, well, that's just kind of a, the page you're putting up now is a more boring version of the page um, that, that, that you just showed us, but we dealt with the deadly sins. There's a lot less text there is now, hopefully, as you can see, uh, much less visual distraction. We've gone to their seafoam green, which is still on brand, but not the dark oranges or dark grays around the periphery. There's a clear call to action. This button, again, I'm going to show you why, is very clear. And we've added trust symbols very deliberately, like we were talking about grayscale trust symbols in the form of these uh, charities that they give money to. Greenpeace, Planned Parenthood, Doctors Without Borders. I'm sure many more of you have heard of those that then have heard of Credo Mobile. And by the way, I want you to make a quick note, the Greenpeace logo is actually a little bit more contrasty, a little bit darker. And I'll talk about why that is, and that's very deliberate and intentional on our part. So another way to show this again, I'm going to go back to sh show you this in the, uh, through the eyes of attention wizard. Now again, software prediction of where we think people are going to look during your first 
few seconds on the page. And as you can see, the hotspots, two of the biggest hotspots are actually in empty areas on the left. And those are just formed by the contrasting sides and the fact that they're in corners. There's a lot of activation in the orange, which is a very unusual color. And the poor benign little green button in the middle is not getting much airplay at all. And that's what I meant by call to action, unclear call to action. Now, when we look at the newly redesigned page, you can see that we've dealt with those visual issues. And the visual issues are something that uh, is, again, really, really, um, you know, we've gotten rid of the distractions. So it may be a more boring page, but uh, we're focusing on, again, what we want deliberately. Here's your phone and the little call out circle on the phone on the left. That's the hero shot. The call to action's clear. That's got a hot spot. And remember I told you that we made Greenpeace a little bit darker, a little more contrasty, so that your eye naturally goes to the top of that trust list. And again, we didn't want it to dominate the visual conversation, but we didn't want some activation on it. And we accomplished that. And so you can say, okay, what's the big deal? There's seven deadly sins. What's the point of all this? And I would say that there is a, this is a big deal. Nothing we did was that hard. Nothing we did here was rocket surgery. And yet the results were spectacular. In this specific, specific case, this Credo Mobile Landing page we redesigned, there was an 84% increase in conversion after we made these changes. So hopefully you've, you've understood the seven deadly sins. Uh, again, these slides as well as the recording will be available to all registered participants. You should get an email coming up soon. But I'm going to ask you for a couple of commitments and then uh, leave off with a special offer. Take off your rose-colored glasses, folks. See your babies as ugly. If you think you have the perfect landing page, let me at it. And, uh, we'll do a, uh, just a quick two-minute review of it, and you, you'll be crying. <laughs> um, and, and get to work is the other thing I would say. Uh, again, if you're doing something about this, that's the only thing that matters. Otherwise, this has all been kind of... Uh, hot air, hopefully it hasn't. Uh, I just want to leave you with one final thing, which is our express reviews. If you're interested in getting your own page critiqued uh, from a very sober perspective to try to find more money on it, uh, we'll be glad to do an express review. You can sign up online. If you mention PPC webinar, I'll be glad to do the first three personally, and uh, hopefully that's an incentive and not a disincentive. And now, Sarah, I want to throw it back to you for some quick Q&A. Uh, if you want to contact me, folks, feel free. I'm very accessible. And uh, appreciate you taking the time. Now, Thank I know you. We have Tim. a lot of questions. Yes, I think I just blew up your IM with questions, and I um, I just got <laughs> another one, so I'm going to send that over to you. Um, awesome questions from the audience. Uh, great comments as well. Um, one was yeah, really you go helpful. Go ahead and ask me if you want to just uh, ask some questions. Uh, okay. You know, yeah. So. Some of them. One was. Um, is it still a best practice to put your call to action in the upper left section of the page? Yes, generally, it, all, uh, all else being equal, your you kind of the center left area is the one that's going to get looked at, regardless of the content of what's there, just on average. And again, Jacob Nielsen's done a lot of studies on this. That doesn't change. The main diagonal of your page is from upper left to lower right. So anything on that diagonal, especially near the upper left, is going to be uh, looked at more. So things that are not important, you put in the upper right corner or the lower left corner, that's where you see the toll-free number or the uh, chat live links, typically, and things like that. Okay. Um, and a question from Sue. What are your thoughts on navigation on the page that will take you away from the landing page? Well, generally, if, especially if it's a pay-per-click landing page, I'd say the best practice is to keep them on the page or to keep them within a microsite, at least, that, that leads off of that page. But uh, one way that we like to do it is to use lightbox popovers. Those have pretty much... Uh, are implemented effectively in all major browsers and you have a consistent experience. So if you have a link and it's just supporting information, pop a light box, pop over, then they dismiss it and the page is still there in the background. They never left the page. Okay. Um, and let's see. And does a video on a landing page increase conversions? Uh, the answer is definitely maybe. <laughs> video is very powerful, as I said, but it's not, I get this question a lot, and you can't just say video yes or no, because the format of the video, the length of it, the script, the actor or actress, the, the, the outfit they're wearing, 
whether you show it to repeat visitors, whether you autoplay it, whether you start with sound on or off, all of those things matter much more than the actual presence or absence of it and will can uh, increase conversion dramatically or tank it. Uh, we just did a landing page test for a software company free trial. We added a video spokesperson, which is a form of video, one of those people that walk on. And in this particular test, we saw about a 15% drop with the video spokespeople. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's not a given that it's going to help. Uh, I'm not one of these kind of followers of Frank Kern who says your landing page should be just one video play window that starts auto-playing when you get on the page. I think that's a little extreme. Okay. Um, and then from Bill, and, and we might have to clarify this, um, have you tested gradient on buttons? Uh, gradients will meaning kind of color changes or, or transitions of color. Uh, we, we do a lot of button testing. I would say that even if you think it looks a little goofy, with buttons you can't have subtle stuff. What you want to do is you want to test extreme changes. Make the button twice as big or make it a completely different color or change the wording on it significantly. That's the kind of stuff I'd play around with. Not real subtle stuff, but you know, a lot of times making the button half as big or twice as big will be the most important thing. Wording is really important. Generally with buttons you want to kind of complete the phrase of, I want to dot, dot, dot. From the perspective of your visitor, what do they want to do? So don't make buttons that say submit or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then a question from Sue. Um, have you done any research on mobile sites? Uh, not so much. Uh, I mean, with the, that's, there's more and more asked for that, and obviously it's, it, there's kind of a tipping point where tablets and, and smartphones are becoming much more prevalent, prevalent and as well as high-speed connections. But um, basically, the it's much harder to optimize for mobile, and you have so little screen real estate, and you can't rely consistently on, you know, even things like JavaScript or Flash working in mobile browsers. So uh, keep it simple and make things easier to navigate and click on. So you really dumb it down and uh, have the button be clickable and, and clear. That, that's a quick advice for mobile. If you're really interested in this, there are companies that specialize in it. Uh, mobile Moxie out of Colorado is a, is a great company to mm -hmm. look up. They can do assessments of your mobile sites as well as create mobile experiences um, and very well versed in conversion as well. Yep. Well, I think that that is uh, all that we have time for today. So uh, this recording will be sent to everyone um, that registered and attended today. Tim, thank you very much. We had some great comments. Um, one was that this was really helpful and informative. Um, someone said that you're awesome and you're funny. So a little flattery there. Um, well, but yeah, you learned something too. <laughs> yes, I think so. I know that we at Vertical Measures have. We've um, implemented a lot of your practices. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, and uh, see you at a live event or a webinar somewhere soon. All right, everyone have a great day. Bye.